The SDSA presents Inside the Set with Set Decor. Today we're joined by set decorator Lisa Clark of the hit Hulu series Little Fires Everywhere. The show stars Reese Witherspoon and Carrie Washington and follows families exploring secrets and class issues set in 1990s Shaker Heights, Ohio. Hi Lisa, thanks for joining us. Thank you Chase for having me here today. Uh, Little Fires Everywhere was a very popular best-selling novel. How did that affect you when you first began the show? I, I read the book several times, so it was really important to me to get to the heart of the characters and what resonated with people. The core of the book is the relationships between women and mothers and daughters. We had the opportunity to meet the writer, Celeste Ng, and she was a very enthusiastic supporter of the adaptation of her book. In addition to adding the layer of the race relations dynamics that was included with uh, Carrie's character. So she was definitely part of the dialogue, uh, but also extremely supportive of our creative process. The two main houses in the show are very much characters in, in the story. Can you tell us a little bit about putting together the Richardson house and the Warren house? They sort of exist in contrast to each other and reflect the nature of Elena's character versus Mia's character. Um, I did a lot of research in Architectural Digest, especially for the Richardson house, to get the correct color palette and the layering of floral textures. It was really important to us that the house was very controlled. We want everything to have a, a home and, an, and everything be in its place at all times, that have no clutter, to reflect uh, the wealth of Elena and Bill, and the fact that Elena cares more about presentation than uh, warmth or joy, and we wanted uh, it to feel that way when the kids were in the space as well. In terms of the Warren house, we wanted to reflect Mia's transitory and artistic nature, so it was important to me that it felt like Everything that was in that house could have been picked up at a thrift store or at the side of the road or maybe traveled with her in the car, but that each piece still had a personality and a soul. I was in college in the 90s, so I remember having to cobble together a space. And a lot of what was available and inexpensive were hand-me-downs and leftovers from the 70s because it was before the 70s was really hip like it is now. So a lot of the items in that house are actually late 70s, maybe early 80s, and just put together in interesting ways. Grew up in the 1990s, so it was interesting to see it portrayed on screen. What were some of the challenges you had in recreating the decade? To pinpoint a, a decade that doesn't have an ossified identity was, was an interesting challenge. We found that we spent a lot of time on eBay, secondhand stores, and thrift stores looking for items that are completely unpopular now. I worked with uh, several buyers on the show. My, one of my main buyers was Robin Holmes, Eva Fersheen and uh, Joanna Vadesky. And we would get ecstatic when they would find some sort of ugly, painted, wrought iron, white framing for a coffee table or something like that. So it was interesting to try to find these items. Some things we had to recreate, like the sofas that were in the sunroom in the Richardson house where the kids hang out, those were all built from scratch because that sort of oversized, overstuffed look is not something that you find anymore. A lot of the fabrics came from Calico Corners um, because they still had access to the kinds of patterns that were popular in the 90s. And a lot of specific research, honestly, tracking down boom boxes from owners on eBay and mini disc mans and things that yeah. that uh, that have survived, but not in large quantities. So it was it was a fun flashback, actually. You were in Hollywood shooting, mm -hmm. and how many stages did you have, and how was the how was it divided up? We had three stages, and the Richardson house actually existed on two separate stages. So the first floor was on one stage, and the second floor was on a second stage, along with all of the Warren house. And then there was a third stage, which had the Lucky Palace, Shaker Times, and small additional swing sets. Right. And then you did the hallway, the living room, the dining room. 
Yeah, so the first floor of the Richardson consisted of uh, the main foyer entrance, there was a dining room and a formal living room, and off the formal living room were his and her office, and then there was the sunroom where the kids hung out, and the kitchen. And then the second floor was a one-sided hallway, which was supposed to look like the kids were living on opposite sides of the hallway. Because the space was tight, we had to flip the kids' bedrooms. We actually did all four kids' bedrooms. When we were in Moody and Trip, we had to flip them. And we did that three times, which was a lot of work because those sets were very layered. And how did the fire affect you and the limitations as to what you could put in? Or I did the first season of Station 19. So I had experience ah, <laughs> with burning right. sets. So I knew a fair amount about what kind of materials to avoid. Some of the details, luckily for me, I didn't have to duplicate, but... The larger items, because they had a title sequence and they also were burned in the episode itself. With Izzy, there were a few pieces of furniture that were constructed. We had the main piece of furniture and then construction took that piece and created a duplicate of it that could be burned. And I had to meet with the AD department so that they would know exactly what materials were in the pieces they were burning. That's pretty complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and a few dollars here in the Yeah, a few dollars budget. here. Yeah, that is yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. and, and approaching the house, did, did you think of uh, Elena as having had the house decorated or did she herself do it? In my head, because she is a control freak, she probably hired an expert that was respected by everyone and then nitpicked that person to death, which none of us have ever <laughs> experienced. So that, that is how I pictured it. There were little details that, that I don't know whether people caught, but for example, I talked to Reese about the fact that I really wanted all of the flowers for the most part to be white because I felt like she was, she was so controlled in her palette, which was something Reese liked you know originally she was surprised that we didn't want to like have more color but I, I wanted to reflect the lack of joy. Reese had told the costume designer that she wanted her character to have a red white and blue quality to the to the costumes and so we decided to reflect some of that especially in the living room. The, a lot of the the fabrics in the house were also from Ralph Lauren because Ralph Lauren was very popular in the 90s. And you got to mix a fair amount of patterns, didn't you? Yes, that was the other thing that came out of both my memory and the research, particularly in Architectural Digest and Home and Garden, is that this was a decade of floral upon floral. <laughs> so we played a lot with with different florals mixed together and plaids which were also popular a lot of times the pillows i'm sure you all remember had a different pattern on the back than they did on the front or maybe the piping was a different color universal drapery department produced all of the drapery and the bedding it was actually all custom made for the richardson alex coronado was my point person on that i had a five page spreadsheet that tracked all of the fabric when it was arriving when it got to universal where it was used down to like was it side a or b of the pillows at one point when i was meeting with him i think we had covered every table in the drapery department except for one so it was quite a big drapery project <laughs> The sofa and chair in the sunroom of the Richardson house, it's covered in wonderful blue denim. I just think that those choices are really good. I actually had to talk Jess into the blue sofas because they wanted them to be off-white and I really resisted that because I thought that it wasn't as interesting of a choice and didn't evoke the era as much. I looked at about 12 different fabric samples because I wanted it to be striped, but I didn't want it to fight with the costumes. So I actually met with the costume designer too, because when she knew that I was going to do blue, she was concerned about the actors being in jeans a lot, which is what kids in that era, they'd be wearing jeans. I got my four samples that I was happy with, and then I sat with her and we picked a color together that we thought was complementary to her costumes, but still would give us that blue and yellow. So it was actually quite a process. In the kitchen, the gorgeous plaid curtains in the dining area and over the sink. The very beginning, like all designers, Jess gave a design presentation to the executive producers and Reese was one of the executive producers. There was a piece of research that Reese was really attached to actually that had a plaid 
curtain in the kitchen. So we spent some time looking for that pattern as well. And I wanted it to read as, as plaid, but still feel fresh and not heavy. So I was looking for something that had a thin enough stripe and maybe had a little bit of yellow and blue in it as well to echo what was going on in the sunrooms. You mentioned Reese and then there's Carrie Washington. What were the actors first impressions of the set? When we were partway through dressing the set, Carrie came in with a couple of the executive producers because she wanted to see our progress and have a conversation about how she viewed Mia's character. We had a wonderful dialogue about how she saw me as an artist, because in my mind, originally, I, I thought of uh, Mia as more of a like collector and a eclectic layering in her art. Carrie really thought that because she came from a hip hop inspired background in New York, her classic training of photography, that she was inspired by Japanese art. So she wanted the level of objects that were decorative around the house to feel more restrained, purposeful. So that was a very interesting dialogue. And from that dialogue, we ended up with, in her bedroom, she wanted the bed to be on the floor because she wanted it to reflect that she wasn't committed to staying in this town. We found strips of leftover pieces of uh, when you develop a photograph, and we chopped them up and put them on the wall to create sort of a Japanese hanging-inspired piece, but not be literally Japanese. And we put little hand mirrors on the wall because we thought if she were a more restrained artist, she might collect one object and iterations of that object. Reese is, is a consummate professional and is very open to conversation as well. When she came into the set, the first floor of the Richardson, she was very happy with the level of control and the color palette. She asked some very intelligent, specific questions about how Elena would move through the house. She would go into the kitchen. Where would she put her keys? There were a lot of conversations about where things would be in drawers to, for her access. It was an, an interesting for me because I got to see how she thought as an actor and the process that she you know, interjected herself and her own actions into the space. The other really wonderful moments was when Celeste Eng came to visit the set. She did a walkthrough with myself and Jess, and she was so ecstatic with how we had brought her vision of the Richardson and the Warren house to life. She said that she felt like somebody had crawled inside of her head and produced it. She really noticed the details that we as set decorators add. Ohio State mugs in the kitchen that were Bill's and the Cleveland Indians pendant behind his desk. She noticed all those things, which was really gratifying to have a writer recognize the level of commitment we had to bringing her vision to life. It's great to hear about all the Cleveland things that you put in and the Ohio things that you put in. And also how Izzy's bedroom came to play a little bit into and sort of reflect a little bit about the creativity in, in Mia's studio and, and her house. We wanted there to be a visual conversation between Izzy's space and Mia's sunroom, Lexi's room, and Pearl's bedroom. Because we felt like Pearl had a fantasy about her life looking more like Lexi's life. Izzy had a fantasy about her life looking more like Mia's life. Space for both Lexi and Izzy's rooms we wanted it to feel like Elena had made those choices. The wallpapers um, actually were custom designed by the, the graphic designer. And we wanted all of the bedding to be floral. So we picked pink for Lexi and lavender for Izzy. Izzy's room in particular, we layered on top of it her rejection of her mother. There was actually a couple plaid blankets on her bed that I'm not sure ever showed up on camera, but we wanted it to look like she maybe stole them from her brother's room. All of the artwork and the posters that she puts up are to cover up the remnants of her mother. Her artwork is on the walls, but it's not displayed prominently because she doesn't feel confident about her voice yet. She's picked other people to represent her that way or other artists at that point in time. In terms of Lexi trying very hard to be her mother, it's a very classic girl's room where everything is in its place. 
So for Pearl's room, we wanted it to have that, that transitional moment that a girl has where she's trying to figure out her path. And Pearl is influenced by many different people, by Elena, by her mother, of course, by the way that Lexi lives. So we wanted the room to reflect a kind of sweetness that her character has. And there's a very pivotal visual moment when Mia and Pearl pick up a bed by the side of the road. Because I knew they were going to lay the bed out on the grass and it was going to be this photographic moment between her mother and herself, I thought an iron bed would be more beautiful and photographic. I didn't want a heavy wooden bed. We found an iron bed on eBay from that era and made sure we could take it apart and lay it out on the grass. The layers and additions to the Warren House as as the series went on, what were some of the challenges in getting that together? Initially, both the directors and the designers said, oh, it's so much work. You don't have to change the living room and the rest of the set as you go along. And I said, no, we are changing it. Because I really felt that it was important to reflect this tug of war between Mia and Pearl about staying in Shaker Heights and it would be reflected in her house because I think that artists are all we're so visual we're always collecting things that inspire us. We actually had an entire binder tracking how that set changed over time because you know you don't always shoot in order (laughs) so there was a lot of going back and forth. Not only were you doing 1990s and 1980s but you also had to go back in time a bit. Well, that was quite a challenge. It was cross-boarded insanity of two episodes. So I picked up the phone and called David and said, please come help me because it was a lot of work and and very little time between when we had to go back and forth what was present day for, for them, 1997, and late 70s, early 80s. We had to redress the entire back half of the Richardson first floor. The kitchen was a huge challenge for myself and for Jess. Didn't have enough time in the schedule to build an entirely new kitchen. She had to wood grain all of the white cabinets to make them look like 70s wood. She built an entirely new island. I had to find a matching set of 1970s appliances. It turns out is extremely difficult. We went on a crazy online search and we found a complete set in Ohio of all places (laughs) that we paid to ship out to California in time to build into the set. What we are calling the Warren House was the house where Elena lived when she was recently married and her children were toddlers. So David also worked with me on that set. It it was important to me that at this point in life, Elena had not reached the level of restriction that we see later. I wanted it to feel like there was more life and joy. And you can really see that in the space and that the furniture that she picked is not so perfectly matched, but still has taste. One of the the sets that I was so excited about was Pauline's Loft, which was Mia's mentor in New York. And we wanted it to feel a little bit like Soho from the early 80s. A lot of the inspiration came from the African-American art community in New York in the early 80s, which was heavily influenced by artists like Warhol and Basquiat, We wanted it to have a very urban, alternative, cutting edge feel to it, which was very different than a lot of the other sets that we were doing. So I was probably 80% shocked on that set, and I was very happy with the direction it was going. And the designer threw me a curveball of changing the wall color. She decided that she wanted like a huge section of wall to be painted red, which wasn't part of my color palette at all, but she was very committed to it because of the fact that a lot of her research had shown red and navy blue as being a big part of the street clothing of the African-American community at that time in New York. David and I had to go back and revisit and, and he got to watch me tear my hair over how to adjust for this set. But luckily, because we have so many um, strong prop houses in LA, Uh, we had a lot of options and we were able to move pieces around 
and make it still have the look and feel that I wanted for that space. Carrie actually had a couple artists that she was interested in featuring, so we went through the process of clearing their art for that set. I uh, decided that I wanted Pauline to have an Arisha altar in her bedroom, and so I went through the process of doing that research and creating a small altar by the bedside. I wasn't there when this happened, but Jess walked Carrie through the set, and she stopped and looked at that altar and said, I can't believe there's an altar to one of the Arishas in this set. And she told Jess to thank me for that level of detail, which meant a lot to me. Shaker Times, the newspaper office, and also Lucky Palace. Tell us about those sets. Those two sets were also considered permanent sets. They were full builds on stage. When we worked on Shaker Times, I actually called an old colleague of mine from graduate school who was a computer scientist and went over exactly what computers would have been in the offices in 1997 if it wasn't a really advanced office and what the routers would look like and it was a it was sort of a fun flashback it had a bullpen of i think it was six or eight desks and a conference area and it had its own library section which for me was a was Difficult, but also a lot of fun because when I was in college at Stanford, I worked in the periodicals department. So I brought all of that memory <laughs> to the table, tracking down old magazines and newspapers. And there was a section of the resource area that was devoted to microfilm microfiche. And so we had to track down working machines, which we purchased as well as microfilm rolls that were from that era. You'd be surprised how expensive and difficult it is to find microfilm. Selecting the computers as well as the furniture, we didn't want everything to look brand new because it was a local newspaper. We thought that it would at least be a few years old and that the money was probably going more into staffing. It must have been really difficult because no one had a big stock of things on hand. For the first six weeks, I think I had three buyers because of having to track down things object by object, really, especially for the for the kids' bedrooms. We found, you know, a, maybe like a white wicker headboard here and then mm -hmm. a matching dresser set, but it would be the wrong height and we'd have to buy legs and raise it. And there was a lot of altering things and finding objects to go together one at a time. So let's talk about the Lucky Palace. I was really proud of the Lucky Palace. I know it's one of those sets that I think decorators really appreciate because they know the work that goes into making something feel real that is every day. A restaurant sounds like a boring set, but it's really not. There were a lot of details that went into the choices in, in the Lucky Palace. For example, we, I wanted those chairs that were really popular in the 80s with the, the black tubular backs. So we, we tracked those down and purchased them. Most of them were red because at Chinese restaurant, typically the upholstery is red. But I purchased a handful of them in green because I wanted it to look like at one point they couldn't get the red chairs anymore and they had to buy whatever they could find. A lot of the things that were hung on the wall, you know, you have to fight your instincts to square things off. I purposefully hung things off kilter from each other because things often feel haphazard in those restaurants. There was a kitchen in the back that was a full dress and we bought a lot of that equipment already rusty and aged down a little bit. One of my favorite moments with that restaurant was the first day of shooting. There were several extras who came in who were Chinese American who were actually chefs in Chinese restaurants because they thought they were gonna have a cooking scene in the back. And they turned to me and they said, yeah, this looks like my uncle's restaurant. And I said, that's the best compliment I could get from anyone. So, you know, it made me feel like we'd done, we'd done it right. At one point, weren't you going to go to Cleveland and shoot? Initially, they were planning on shooting most of the exteriors at Cleveland, and they wanted to shoot the exterior of the high school and all that. It became cost prohibitive, and they ended up shooting it all in Los Angeles. So there was a lot of um, challenges, particularly for the art department, around creating weather in Los Angeles. I spoke with a friend and she said to me, oh, I loved little fires everywhere and I recognized the house in Shaker Heights. And because this is a friend from Cleveland and I said, well, no, Paula, actually you didn't recognize the house because 
it was all shot in LA. Uh, and so we both laughed and you well, guys were very successful. It was a concerted effort to make it to make it look believable. Jess is actually from New Jersey. She's from the East Coast. So it was important to her too that it didn't look like LA. When we were dressing the house for Christmas, there's a big um, vertical stained glass window in the foyer of the set, which is where the Christmas one of the Christmas trees lived in the house. But in the actual location where that stained glass window is, is a curved staircase. The set dressers had this brilliant idea, take two extension ladders, one shorter than the other, and lashing them together on different steps, and then roping the lights around the ladders so that when it was night, it looked like the Christmas tree because oh. there was no way to get the Christmas tree where it was supposed to be on the set. Wow, fabulous. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, I stood in there with my lead man, Nelson Bush. I said, okay, how are we going to rig this tree? And he said, we're not, we're going to make a tree. You had a really terrific crew. Uh, can you let us know who all you were worked with? My regular first buyer is Robin Holmes, who I've worked with for many years now. Eva Fersheen started out as well at the beginning. Joanna Vineski came in and was there for quite a while on the show. I was lucky to have her. She has a lot of experience with period, as does Eva. Jill Dibler, who, who came in towards the end. Rhonda Elliott, who came in and helped significantly with Shaker Times when we were behind the eight ball. Beth Emerson also came in and, and helped out for a week. So I had a lot of people with, with a lot of experience. It's been great chatting with you today, Lisa. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com.